On Being with Krista Tippett is supported in part by the John Templeton Foundation, funding research and catalyzing conversations that inspire people with awe and wonder. Discover the latest findings on neuroscience, cosmology, and the origins of life at templeton.org. I really believe that poetry is something we humans need almost as much as we need water and air. We can forget this. And then there are times in a life and in the life of the world where only a poem, perhaps in the form of the lyrics of a song or a half sentence we ourselves write down, can touch the mystery of ourselves and the mystery of others. So my interest when I get into conversation with a poet is not to talk about poetry, but to delve into what this way with words and sound and silence teaches us about being fully human. This adventure we're all on that is by turns treacherous and heartbreaking and revelatory and wondrous. I've been reading Ada Limon for years and was so happy when she was named the 24th Poet Laureate of the United States. And it was an incredible treat to interview her before 1,000 people packed together in a concert hall on a cold Minnesota night. Her presence on that stage was electric. I think we all came a little bit more alive. And I'm not sure I've had a conversation across all these years that was a more unexpected and exuberant mix of gravity and laughter. Laughter of delight and of blessed relief. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. I spoke with Ada Limon at the Ted Mann Concert Hall in Minneapolis. We were brought together in a collaboration between Northrop at the University of Minnesota and Milkweed Editions. Look at all these people. <laughs> oh my. I, I want to say, first of all, how happy I am to be doing something with Milkweed, which I have known since I moved to Minnesota for, I don't know, over a quarter century ago to be this magnificent but quiet local publisher. <laughs> and now we have watched it in these 25 years go from strength to strength to strength. And now I'll just say it again, they are the publisher of the 24th Poet Laureate of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> And I am so thrilled to have this conversation with Ada Limon to be part of our first season. For her voice of insistent honesty and wholeness and wisdom and joyfulness. Mm -hmm. And also I'm so happy to be together with you in the old fashioned flesh, <laughs> which we no longer take for granted. <laughs> That's true. Um, I, you know, I have your books and there's some too. I'm really longing, I realized as I was preparing for this, I'm just, of course I read, I read poetry, I read a lot of poetry in these last years, but I realized just I'm craving hearing poetry. Mm. So I think we're gonna just have a lot of poetry tonight and I hope, I don't think anybody here will mind. Um, but I also feel a little bit out of practice with this live event thing. So we'll just be on an adventure together. Um, so you grew up, in Sonoma, California, but my sense is that it's not the land of Zinfandel and Pinot Noir that <laughs> immediately comes to mind now when someone says Sonoma. Yeah, um, yeah, I grew up in uh, Glen Ellen and Sonoma, California, born and raised. I was actually born at home, um, and uh, it, is, it, it is definitely wine country um, and all of the things that go along with that. But it's also a land that is uh, really incredibly beautiful and special and sacred in a lot of different ways. And sometimes when you're going through it, you can kind of see the monocrop of vineyards that it's become. But in reality, it's home to so many different kind of wildlife. And the Sonoma Coast is a really special place in terms of how it's been preserved and protected throughout the years. Mm -hmm. So it's a very special place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there a religious or spiritual background in your childhood there, um, however you would describe that now? 
Yeah, um, there wasn't a religious practice. In fact, my mother uh, is and was an atheist. And um, it's funny to tell people that you were raised an atheist because they, they're like, really? But I, I was. Um, and um, they're like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Um, and uh, Cradle atheist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah was, no, really, I was. And uh, enough so that actually, you know, as I... I would, I would always sort of interrogate her about her beliefs and what, you know, well, do, do you think this? Do you think that? You know, what happens after we die? And she says, well, you die. And you get to be part of the earth. Mm. And you get to, you know, be part of what happens next. And, you know, it was just a very sort of matter-of-fact way of looking at the world. And so that was, that's really a lot of how I was raised. And then I would say in terms of the sacred, it was always the natural world. And, you know, both parents, both all four of my parents, I should say, would point those things out. That sort of this, this special quality of connectedness mm -hmm. that, um, that the natural world offers us. So I think that's where, for me, um, I found any sort of sense of spirituality or belonging um, all came and still comes from the natural world. Mm -hmm. And also I read somewhere that Sundays were a day that you were moving back and forth between okay. your two homes. You, your parents divorced and everybody remarried. And yeah. that, that's also, you know, not the religious association with Sunday. Right? You're right. <laughs> right. And it, it's a very interesting thing to be a kid that goes back and forth. And I'm sure many people have this experience or have had that experience where you're moving from one home to another. And if it's weekly there's a day of the week and you do it. And for us, it was Sundays. And um, for a long time, Sundays kind of unsettled me, yeah. um, even as an adult. And I always thought it was just because I had to work. <laughs> but I think there was, a, you know, there was a, something deeper going on there, which was that idea of like, oh, this is when you pack up and you move. And I, had, I even had a pet mouse named um, Fred, which you would think well, I would have had like a more creative name <laughs> for. <laughs> Were the mouse, but his name was Fred, um, and I would, you know, put, he had a little cage. I would, you know, make sure he was, and he would get bundled up and carried from house to house. Um, so yeah, so Sundays were were a different kind of uh, practice, if mm -hmm. you will, yes. a different kind of um, observation. <laughs> yeah, and you have said that you um, fell in love with poetry in high school. Yeah, and you know. Poetry is absolutely, this is not something I knew would happen when I started this, but poetry now is kind of at the heart of on being. It's woven through everything. And, and yet, sort of my, I think my investigation or m my curiosity is not so much talking about poetry, but about where poetry comes from in us yeah. and what poetry works in us. And I just, I wonder if you think about your teenage self yeah. who fell in love with poetry, can you locate that? Yeah, that's such a wonderful question. I feel like there's, um, there's so many elements to that discovery, right? When you, when you find a song or you find something and you think this, mm -hmm. I don't know why this, but this. And um, I remember reading, it was Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, and um, it's a villanelle, so it's got you know a, a very strict rhyme scheme. It's repeating words, and I I knew immediately that it was a love poem and a lost poem, mm -hmm. and um, you know I knew that at 15, and I think there was a part of me that felt like so much of what I had read up until then was meant to instruct or was meant to offer wisdom. And here was something that was so well crafted. I mean, and people to this day will say it's one of the most expert villanelles ever written. It's so well crafted, and yet it doesn't actually offer any answers. Hmm. It just offers more questions. And there's sort of an invitation at the end and I find, I think it was that. I think that I trusted its unknowing <laughs> and its mystery mm. in a way that I distrusted maybe other forms of writing up until then. That's, that's so wonderful. And 
You know, when, when people describe you as a poet, um, you know, they'll talk about things about intimacy and emotional sincerity and your observations of the natural world. And if I had to condense you as a poet into a couple of words, I actually think you're about, and these are words you use also, wholeness mm -hmm. and balance. Mm -hmm. So that even when you're talking about the natural world, we're, we are of it, not mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. um, and also that notion, and these are other things you've said, that you know, poetry recognizes our wholeness, mm -hmm. and even as it relieves us of the need to sum everything up, yeah. as you said, to give instruction or answers where to give answers would be to disrespect the gravity of the questions. Yes. I think that's very true. I feel like there's a level in which um, it, it offers us a, a place to be that feels closer to who we are. Mm. Because there is always that interesting moment where someone asks you, you know, who you are, even just the simple question of like, how are you? Like if we really took a minute to think about it, how am I? How am I? <laughs> you could really go to some deep places if you really interrogated the self and thought, how am I right now at this moment? Okay, interesting. I, yeah, I've got a lot of feelings moving through me. And I feel like poetry makes hmm. the world for that experience as opposed to, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, right, good, good, how are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, or I'm suffering, or, right, it just, it makes room for all of these things that can also be, it holds all the truths at once, too, Yeah. right? That you can be joyful, and you can actually be really having a wonderful time, and then you can also be like, oh, I'm a little anxious about this thing that's happening next week, or, you know, all of these things, it makes room for all of those things. And um, I know that when I discovered it, uh, for myself as a teenager that I thought, oh, this is more like music where it's like something is expressing yeah. itself to you and you're expressing yourself to it and together you kind of have this relationship, which I, I hadn't had before. Yeah, because it, it's made with words, but it's also working with, it's also sensory and yeah. it's bodily. Yeah. It's got breath, right? It's got all those spaces, the sejuras and the line breaks, it's breath. And then that's also the space for us to sort of walk in as a reader, be like, oh, what's happening here? <laughs> why, why are all these blank spaces? You know, it has silence built all around it. Silence, yeah. which we don't get enough of. When you open the page, there's already silence. And we think, well, what's, what are we supposed to do with that silence? You know, and we, we, we read naturally for meaning. I mean, that's, that's how we read. We read for sense. And poetry doesn't really allow you to do that because it's working in the smallest units of sound and syllable and clause and line break and then, you know, the sentence. So you get to have this experience with language that feels somewhat disjointed and in that way almost feels like, oh, this makes more sense as the language for our human experience yeah. than, let's say, a, a news report. I mean, isn't even that, that question you asked, what am I supposed to do with all that silence? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's one way to talk about the challenge of being human and walking through a life. Yeah, and I think about that all the time. I mean, I have people who ask me, like, hey, you know, how, do you, how do you write poems? And you talk about process, and it's always an interesting question because I feel like my process changes and I change. And, um, but I think the biggest thing for me is to begin with silence. Mm -hmm. Like, well, if you're having trouble writing or, or creating or whatever it is you make, like when was the last time you just sat in silence with yourself and listened to what which, which was also happening? makes it spiritual practice. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, something I, I remember reading is that your you grew up in an English speaking household, but mm -hmm. your paternal grandfather mm -hmm. spoke Spanish mm -hmm. and that you just loved to listen to him. Yeah. And I also just wondered if that experience of loving sound and the cadence of this language that was yours and not yours, yeah. if that also flowed into this love of poetry. Yeah, I mean, I think there was also, I mean, he also was a singer, so he would just sing. And you could, so a lot of, um, a lot of what he knew in Spanish and remembered in Spanish were songs. Um, so it was always this level in which 
that what was being uh, created and made as he was in my life was always uh, musical. Yeah. So I think there was a lot of, not only was it music, but then it was music in Spanish. So it had this kind of wonderful way of um, existing in an aliveness of a language, an aliveness mm. of a second language, as opposed to just sort of a need, you know, to get something or to use. It in, wasn't, in it wasn't it used wasn't, as a tool. Right, it wasn't functional in exactly. a way. Exactly, mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I love it when my conversation, when my, when I feel like the conversations I'm having start to be in conversation with each other. <laughs> so, um, coming in future weeks is a, is a conversation with a technologist and artist named, named James Bridle, mm -hmm. uh, whose, whose point is that language itself, um, the sounds we made mm -hmm. and the words we finally formed and the mm -hmm. imagery and the metaphors mm -hmm. were all primally, organically rooted in the natural world of which we were part. Um, and that there was this break when we moved from pictographic language, mm. which, which is characters which directly refer to the thing spoken, mm. and when we moved to the phonetic alphabet. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at even the letters we use in our, um, the A actually was initially a drawing of an ox, mm. And M was water, yeah. and the Q has the tail of a monkey. Yeah. And we've forgotten this, but something I started thinking, and I feel, once I, you know, with this, with this frame, really this sense of homecoming, our and our belonging mm -hmm. in the natural world mm -hmm. runs all the way through every single one of your poems. Um, so maybe just to use a natural world metaphor, <laughs> to just dip our toes into the water, would you read um, Sanctuary? From, oh, yeah. And it's page six of The Hurting Kind. Sanctuary. Suppose it's easy to slip into another's green skin, bury yourself in leaves and wait for a breaking, a breaking open, a breaking out. I have before been tricked into believing I could be both an I and the world. The great I of the world is both gaze and gloss, to be swallowed by being seen, a dream, to be made whole by being not a witness, but witnessed. To be made whole by being not a witness, but witnessed. Can you say a little bit about that? I remember having this experience, um, oh, I was sort of very deeply alone during the early days of the pandemic when uh, my husband's work brought him um, to another state and I was just, it was just me, the dog and the cat. and the trees. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was feeling very isolated. My family's all in California. And, um, you know, many of us were having different experiences. And I was having this moment where I kept being like, well, if I just deeply look at the world like I do, as poets do, I will feel a sense of belonging. I will trust the world. And I will feel at peace. And this time, what came to me as I stood and looked at the trees was that, oh, it isn't just me looking. It is the world and the trees and the grasses and the birds looking back. And it felt like this is the language of reciprocity. This means that I am in a reciprocal relationship with the natural world, not that it is my job to be the poet that goes and says, tree, I will describe it to you, <laughs> right? I have a lot of poems that basically are that. <laughs> um, but instead, to really have this moment of like, oh, no, it is also, you know, it's our work together to see one another. And to not have that bifurcated for a moment is where that poem came from. Um, you know, I, that just took me back to this 
moment in the pandemic where I took so many walks in my neighborhood that I've lived in for so many years and saw things I'd never seen before, um, including these massive, just like suddenly looking down where the trees were and mm. seeing and, 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 and understanding, <laughs> just really having this moment where I understood that it's their neighborhood and I'm living in it, right? <laughs> that it's not my neighborhood and they look beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I think there was these moments that that quietness, that aloneness, that solitude, that you know, as hard um, as they were, um, I think hopefully we've learned some lessons from that. Yeah. You you said a minute ago that um, that poetry has breath built into it, and and you said also that it you have said it it it's meant to make us breathe, mm -hmm. and isn't it strange? <laughs> That breathing is something that we have to get better at. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, the, do you remember the Colbert Report when Stephen Colbert was doing the, er, the earlier show? And he had this one skit where he said, I love breathing. I could do it all day long. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I always think about that because, of course, it's so ironic that we have to think about our breath, right? It's the thing that keeps us alive. We have it's to a, do breath work. We literally, yeah, like, oh, take a deep breath. And then we get annoyed when it works, too. We're like, ugh, I feel calmer. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I lived in New York City, my two best friends, um, I, I would always try to get them to go to yoga with me, and they would say, I don't want to go to yoga. And I was like, why? And they said, I just don't want anyone telling me when to breathe. <laughs> But it's true, I feel like our breath is so important to, you know, how we move through the world, how we react to things, right? Okay. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it also says something about this time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just back to this idea that, that there is this organic, automatically breathing thing of which we're part, <laughs> and that we, we even have to rediscover that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's whole books about like, <laughs> how to breathe. <laughs> a lot of them are in the On Being <laughs> studio. They come yeah. in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, it, and, it, and, and yet at the same time, I do feel like there's this, this it's so much power in it. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like it's very interesting when you actually have to get away from it. When you, because you can also do the other thing where you focus too much on the breath. And you can't and do you it. forget how to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it is, it's, it's this weird moment of being aware of it and then also letting it go at the same time. Uh -huh. And then a trauma of the pandemic was that our breathing mm. became a danger yeah. to strangers and beloveds. Very much so. And we were given to remember that civilization is built on something so tender mm -hmm as bodies breathing in proximity to other bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to feel that moment of everyone recognizing what it is to kind of look out for one another, mm -hmm. right? And to, and have to do that in the antithesis of who we are, which is was to separate, yeah. right? Because how do we care for one another? We hold each other. Yeah. We touch each other. And then in this moment it was we cared for each other by being apart yeah it was completely unnatural yeah it was interesting to me to to realize how people turn to you in pandemic mm. because of who you are mm. it sounds like and you were you writing the hurting kind um during the pandemic yeah, and i lockdown? would say about 50 percent maybe 60 percent of it was written during the pandemic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know um i do feel like you you were one of the people who was really kind of really writing with kind of care and precision and curiosity about what we were going through. Mm -hmm. And that was in shorter supply than one would think. I mean, we were so focused on survival and yeah. illness and vaccines and bad news. Um, I, it feels important to me right now because, you know, I want to talk to you about this a little bit, what we've mm -hmm. been through. And I think when we're talking about this, 
we're talking about who we are right now because mm-hmm. we're all carrying this. And it feels important to me whenever I'm in a room right now, and, it's, and I haven't been in that many rooms with this many people sitting close together, mm-hmm. that we all just acknowledge that even if we all, this exact same configuration of human beings, had sat in this exact room mm-hmm. in February 2020, and we're back now, we're changed at a cellular level. Mm-hmm. And we're at a new place, but we have to carry and process that. Um, So anyway, I got the hurting kind, uh, the galley in the mail from Mm -hmm. Milkweed. Um, And I remember sitting on my sofa where I spent an inordinate amount of time Mm -hmm. and reading it. And the one I'd love you to read is um, not the saddest thing in the world. Mm. You know, this is the one where I felt like subtly, it's, there's subtlety to it, but you just named so much in there. Mm. Page 20. Oh, thank you. I don't expect you to have the page number <laughs> memorized. <laughs> Not the saddest thing in the world. All day, I feel some itchiness around the collar constriction of living. I write the date at the top of a letter. Though no one has been writing the year lately, I write the year. Seems like a year you should write, huge and round and awful. In between my tasks, I find a dead fledgling, maybe dove, maybe don't know to be honest, too embryonic, too see-through and we. I don't even mourn him, Just all matter-of-fact-like, take the trowel, plant the limp body with a new hosta under the main feeder. Seems like a good place for a close-eyed thing, forever closed-eyed, under a green plant, in the ground, under the feast, up above. Between the ground and the feast is where I live now. Before I bury him, I snap a photo and beg my brother and my husband to witness this nearly clear body. Once it has been witnessed and buried, I go about my day, which isn't ordinary exactly, because nothing is ordinary, not even when it is ordinary. Now something's breaking always on the skyline, falling over and over against the ground, sometimes unnoticed sometimes covered up like sorrow, sometimes buried without even a song. Yeah. Between the ground and the feast is where I live now. That really spoke to me on my sofa. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like that between space, that liminal space, is a place where you know, we were living for so long, mm-hmm. you know, and many of us still living in that between space of how how do I go into the world and safely and how do I move through the world with safety and caretake myself and caretake others and, yeah. you know, what's good for my body and my mental health, all of those things. And that uh, that between space was the only space that really made sense to me. Yeah. I I mean, I think, you know, coming back to this idea that poetry is as embodied as it is linguistic, Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something we didn't know how to talk about. Um, Also because so much of what's been, and and again, it's not just in the past, right? What has happened um, was happening, has been happening below the level of consciousness in our bodies. The Mm -hmm. fear response, the stress response, it had so many other kinds of ripple effects that were so perplexing. Um, these full body experiences of isolation and ungrieved losses and loneliness and fear and uncertainty, just uncertainty is so Mm -hmm. hard on our bodies. Um, And you you also wrote about that and you also wrote this essay. I mean, just the the title of this, I feel is such an invitation and not the kind of invitation that was being made. So Mm -hmm. on preparing the body for a reopened world. Mm. Yeah, I had a moment where I hadn't realized how delighted I had I was to go about my world without my body. 
Um, I, because I was teaching on Zoom and I was just a face. And I found myself being very comfortable with just being a face. <laughs> and with just being a head. Yeah. And I would just have these whole like moments when people would be like, oh, and then we'll meet in person. And I was like, <gasps> I don't want you to witness my body. <laughs> Only my head is for you. <laughs> my body yeah. is for me. And it really struck me that how much I was like, how do I move through this world? Like remembering what it is to be a body, I think, to be a woman, you know, who moves through the world with a body, um, who gets commented on the body, who, yeah. you know, for me, I have pain, so I move through the body in pain. And there was an ease, I think, that I could, that, that living in the head-only world was, was kind of a, a poet's dream on some level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, isn't this therapeutic also for us all to laugh about this now? Also, to know that we can laugh about it now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're still, well, a lot of us, I think, are still a little agoraphobic. Oh, definitely. Definitely. This might be hard for some of you right here. You know, yeah. um, I think that there is a lot uh, about being, you know, trying to figure out who we are with ourselves. You know, that's that's the work of poetry in general, right? Like we're we just ask questions, we get curious, we interrogate, and we ask over and over again. You know, we say, "Oh, I want to write about this flower," and then we say, "Why this flower? Why that color? Why not that weed?" What you know, that's like our our entire world is spent that way. And then to do it on top of, you know, really global grief, um, yeah. that is a, is a very kind of different work. Mm -hmm. um, because then you think, well, who am I to look at this flower? Who am I to live? Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, it comes back to these questions of like, why do I get to be lucky in this way? And, and is it okay for me to spend time looking at this tree. Is it okay? Is this, you know, the, the danger of all poets and, and, and I think artists in general is at some moment we think we don't deserve to do this work mm -hmm. um, because what does it do, you know? And I feel like uh, the, the thing that always kept coming back to me, especially, you know, in, those, in the early days was like, it, what does it do? Well, right now it anchors you to the world. Mm -hmm again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And it says, you are here. And I felt like every day I'd write a poem was literally like putting that little you are here dot on a map. Yeah. And then I would be like, okay, I was there. And the next day I'd wake up and be like, well, I was there yesterday. I wonder if I'm here again today or in a new place. And that was really essential to my practice of... Um, who, who I was as a, as a creative person in the middle of, um, of such, a, such an enormous tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I chose a couple of poems that you wrote, again, to, that, to kind of speak to this. And, and I think for all of us, kind of mark, mark this, which is important. Yeah. Um, and one of them, this is also in The Hurting Kind, is um, Lover, mm. which is page 77. Um, I remember writing this poem because I really love the word lover. And it's a kind of polarizing word, <laughs> right? Where some of you were like, ew, as soon as I said it. <laughs> I feel like I could hear that response, right? I, I did not hear that response. There was a little bit of like, ooh, <laughs> lover. <laughs> <laughs> Easy light storms in through the window, soft edges of the world smudged by mist, a squirrel's nest rigged high in the maple. I've got a bone to pick with whoever is in charge. All year I've said, you know what's funny? And then nothing, <laughs> nothing is funny. 
which makes me laugh in an oblivion is coming sort of way. A friend writes the word lover in a note, and I'm strangely excited for the word lover to come back. <laughs> come back, lover. Come back to the five and dime. I could squeal with the idea of blissful release. Oh, lover, what a word, what a world, this gray waiting in me, a need to nestle deep into the safekeeping of sky. I am too used to nostalgia now, a sweet escape of age, centuries of pleasure before us and after us, still, right now, a softness like a worn fabric of a nightshirt. And what I do not say is, I trust the world to come back, return like a word long forgotten and maligned for all its gross tenderness, a joke told in a sunbeam, the world walking in, ready to be ravaged, open for business. <laughs> Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute. Fetzer supports a movement of organizations that are applying spiritual solutions to society's toughest problems. Learn more at Fetzer.org. So you're the, the poem you wrote, Joint Custody. Mm. Uh, you've read it, you get asked to read it. It's wonderful. Mm. And I want you to read it. Mm. And it's kind of, I, I think it's something, there are things we all learned also. Mm. And I think it's in that category. But I want you to read it second because, because what I found in Bright Dead Things, mm. which was a couple of years before that, certainly pre-pandemic, in the before times, um, was the way you wrote a way that you spoke of the same story of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then what we find in the second poem is a kind of evolution. Oh, so yeah. would you read, um, it's called Before, yeah. um, page 46. Yeah. I, l I love that you do this. This is, she's like, she's teaching me a lesson. <laughs> but I mean, I've listened to every podcast she's done, so I'm aware. <laughs> I'm, this is amazing. And okay. this is about your childhood, right? <laughs> and we all have this, right? Our, our childhood stories. Yeah. 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 Um, before. No shoes and a glossy red helmet. I rode on the back of my dad's Harley at seven years old. Before the divorce. Before the new apartment. Before the new marriage before the apple tree, before the ceramics and the garbage, before the dog's chain, before the koi were all eaten by the crane, before the road between us, there was the road beneath us, and I was just big enough not to let go. Henno Road, creek just below, rough wind, chicken legs, and I never knew survival was like that. If you live, you look back and beg for it again, the hazardous bliss before you knew what you would miss. Okay. And then joint custody from <laughs> the amazing. hurting kind several years later and a changed world later. Page 40. Thank you. Joint custody. Why did I never see it? for what it was, abundance. Two families, two different kitchen tables, two sets of rules, two creeks, two highways, two step parents with their fish tanks or eight tracks or cigarette smoke or expertise in recipes or reading skills. 
I cannot reverse it. The record scratched and stopped to the original chaotic track. But let me say, I was taken back and forth on Sundays, and it was not easy, but I was loved each place. And so I have two brains now, two entirely different brains, the one that always misses where I'm not, and the one that is so relieved to finally be home. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. You see what I did? <laughs> <laughs> I, was so, I was so fascinated when I read the earlier poem. Yeah. It's so interesting because I feel like one of the things, you know, as you age as an artist, as a human being, um, you start to rethink the stories that people have told you and start to wonder what was useful and what was not useful. And there are times where I think people have said, like, you know, as, as, a, as a child, oh, you, came, you, you come from a broken home. Yeah. And I remember thinking, well, it doesn't, it's not broken. It's just bigger. <laughs> I get four parents that come to the school nights. And I felt like I was not brave enough to own that for myself. Mm. And it wasn't until really when I was writing that poem that the word came to me and I was in the backyard by myself, as many of us were in, by ourselves, and I kept thinking how I was, I missed all my family. Um, and I missed my father and his wife and I missed my mother and stepfather. And it was, you know, this, this moment of like, oh, this is abundance. Mm. This is not a problem. This is a gift. And that reframing was really important to me. Mm. And then I kept thinking, what are the other things I can do that? Because <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of unhelpful things that have been told to me. Um, and I found it really useful, a really useful tool to like go back in and start to think about what was just no longer true mm. or maybe it never been true mm. um, as we turn the corner from pandemic although we will not completely turn the corner I just wanted to read something you wrote on Twitter which was hilarious I never go there very much anymore <laughs> but you said this was, I don't know I just happened to be I, I, I saw you again today I just set my wash settings to who I'd like to be in 2023 Casual, warm, normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was true. This is, you know, the poet's brain is always like that. Like there's a little, there, I was just doing the wash and I was like, casual, warm, <laughs> normal. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> I could really go for that. <laughs> Um, something that you that you reflect on a lot that I, I would love to just draw you out on a bit is I, I think people who love language the most and work with language also are most intensely aware of the limits of language mm -hmm. and, and that's partly why you're working so hard mm -hmm. talk about the, any of the limits of language the, the failure of language yeah I mean I think the failure of language is what really draws me to poetry in general. And I, I think most poets are, are drawn to that because it feels like what we're, what we're always trying to do is say, is say something that can't always entirely be said, even in the poem, even in the completed poem. Is that Buddhist, the finger pointing at the moon? Yes. Right? Sometimes you're, you're, and it's so much, it's exactly. pointing, pointing, yeah. Exactly, and I feel like there's a level of mystery that's, so, that's allowed in the poem, right? That feels like, okay, I can maybe read this into it, I can put myself into it, and it becomes sort of its own thing. And that feels like it's an active thing as opposed to a finished thing, a closed thing. Mm. And so it's giving room to have those failures be a breaking open and um, for someone else to stand in it and bring whatever they want to it. 
but I, you know, when we talk about the limitations of language in general, I find, I mean, language is so strange and it often falls apart for me. And I'm sure it does for many of you where you start to think about a phrase or a word comes to you and you're like, is that a word? You know, like you're like with, <laughs> with, you know, <laughs> like it suddenly just falls apart, <laughs> you know? And I feel yes. like there are moments that like, yeah. you know, I, I travel a lot in South America with my husband and like by the end of like the second week, I have, my brain has gone like it's Spanish and English and I'm trying and I, I'll say, look at him and be like, how, how much degrees is it? Right. You know? Yeah. And he's like, are you trying to ask me what the weather is? <laughs> I'm like, yes, yeah. yes I am. <laughs> so, but I trust those moments. I trust yeah. those moments where it feels like, oh, right. This is a weird, we, you know, the language is strange yeah. and it's evolving. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I love it, but I think that we, you, you go to it as a, as a poet in an awareness of not only its limitations and its failures, but also very curious about where you can push it in order to make it into a new, a new thing. Mm -hmm. Would you read um, this poem, The End of Poetry, which I feel speaks to that a bit. Yeah. That's page 95. Yeah. This definitely speaks to that. So sometimes it feels like language and poetry I often start with sounds. They all, poems all come to me differently. Sometimes it's sound, sometimes it's image, sometimes it's a note from a friend with the word lover. Um, you know, sometimes it's just staring out the window. And this po poem was basically a list of all the poems I didn't think I could write because it was, you know, the early days of the pandemic and I kept thinking, I mean, just that poetry had kind of given up on me, I guess. And so I gave up on it. And then what happened was the list that was in my head of poems I wasn't going to write became this poem. A poem. <laughs> yeah. The End of Poetry. Enough of osseous and chickadee and sunflower and snowshoes, maple and seeds, samara and shoot. Enough chioscuro. Enough of thus and prophecy and the stoic farmer and faith and our father and tis of thee. Enough of bosom and bud, skin and God not forgetting and star bodies and frozen birds. Enough of the will to go on and not go on or how a certain light does a certain thing. Enough of the kneeling and the rising and the looking inward and the looking up. Enough of the gun, the drama, and the acquaintance's suicide, the long lost letter on the dresser. Enough of the longing and the ego, and the obliteration of ego. Enough of the mother and the child, and the father and the child. And enough of pointing to the world, weary and desperate. Enough of the brutal and the border. Enough of, can you see me? Can you hear me? Enough, I am human. Enough, I am alone, and I am desperate. Enough of the animal saving me, enough of the high water, enough sorrow, enough of the air and its ease. I am asking you to touch me. Okay. So at this point in my notes, <laughs> I have three words in bold with exclamation points, <laughs> or no, question marks. Um, God, mm. <laughs> which I don't think we're going to get to talk about today. <laughs> so we have to do this another time. Um, tacos, oh, yeah. because you did write a great essay called Taco yeah. Truck Saved My Marriage. Yeah, it's true. That maybe, <laughs> maybe that speaks for itself. And um, I actually, it seemed to me that your marriage was in fine shape. It's fine. It's, <laughs> it's beautiful. And you were just using that. But tacos that. help. <laughs> um, and napping, we, we both love. Yes. That we don't need to belabor that. Um, okay, there's this poem, <laughs> which I've never heard anybody ask you to read, called Where the Circles Overlap. Oh, yes. In the Hurting Kind. And honestly, this feels to me like... Um, like if I were teaching a college class, I would, I would have somebody read this poem and say, discuss. Yeah. 
And I, so can we just have engage this intellectual exercise with you? Because it's completely fascinating, and I'm not sure what's going on, and I'd like you to I'm tell me. I'm so glad that, that you, uh, it you asked this. I feel like this. it brings us back to wholeness somehow. Because I love this poem, and no one has ever asked me to read this poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you'll see why in a minute. Yeah, yeah you're going to be like, oh. Or you'll just be like, that makes total sense to me. Where the circles overlap. We burrow, we hunch, we beg and beg. The thesis is still a river. At the top of the mountain is a murderous light, so strong it's like staring into an original joy, foundational, that brief kinship of hold and hand, the space between teeth right before they break into an expansion, a heat. We hurry, we hanker, we beg and beg. When should we mourn? We think time is always time, and place is always place. Bottle brush trees attract the nectar lovers, and we capture, capture, capture. The thesis is still the wind. The thesis has never been exile. We have never been exiled. We have been in the sun, strong and between sleep, no hot gates, no house decayed, just the bottle brush alive on all sides with want. Um, the thesis, <laughs> where is he? The thesis is still the wind. The thesis is still a river. The thesis mm. has never been exiled. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think this poem for me is very much about learning to find a home and a sense of belonging in a world where being at peace is actually frowned upon, mm. where being at ease is not okay. You know, we, we prioritize busyness. You know, oh, I'm stressed. Oh, if you want to know about stress, let me tell you, I'm stressed. You know? That's right. Right? Yeah. I, I like to tell my friends when they say they're really stressed, I'll be like, oh, I took the most wonderful nap. <laughs> you should take a nap. I know it's cruel. But I think there's so much in this poem that's about that idea that, you know, the thesis is that's returned to the river, this, I, this idea of original belonging, that we are home, mm -hmm. that we have enough, that we are enough. And the title comes from, you know, when, when you're planting a tree and you're looking for where the sun is the right space, you can draw where the circles are, mm -hmm. and they'll tell you to plant where the circles overlap. So it's mm. actually about fostering yourself mm. in, in the sun, in the right place, mm. creating the right habitat. And the right habitat for that, for all human flourishing, right, is for us to begin with a sense of belonging, mm. with a sense of ease, with a sense that even though we are desirous and even though we want all of these things, right now, being alive, being human is enough. That's really hard. Mm -hmm. And when you say, I know, I know, you sh I know, one shouldn't take po poems apart like this. But the thesis, the thesis is the river. What does that mean? Why, what is the thesis word of the wind? Yeah, that the like the like the original idea. Like you know, when we say like uh -huh. our thesis statement, or or even when we say like um, this is how vitality right. Looks. Like this, this is, it what is vitality still it is still like. the wind. It is still the river. Yeah. It is still the elements. Yeah. Those are, that's still it. We're back at the natural world. Yeah. Metaphors and yeah. belonging. Yeah. Um, you um, hosted this, the, the Slow Down podcast, a mm -hmm. great poetry podcast for a while. And um, thank you. Yeah. I guess maybe you had to quit doing that since you have this new job. Mm -hmm. um, 
you wrote, you said there um, in a place, as I've aged, I've had, I have more time for tenderness, mm. for the poems that are so earnest they melt your spine a little. Mm-hmm. I have decided that I'm here in this world to be moved by love and let myself be moved by beauty, which is such a wonderful mission statement. Mm. Um, and also, <laughs> that phrase, as I've aged, yes. can I just say, you say that a lot, and I just, I would like to tell you that you have a lot more aging to do. I hope so. I hope so. A lot. I'm I would, really glad you're enjoying it, because there's many more decades. You're I very young. <laughs> I love it. My grandmother is 98. I just saw her. Yeah. So, you know, I'm hoping. No, I also <laughs> think it's, 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 there's so much, it's, aging is underrated, right? The, the bright yeah. side is not talked about. But yeah. I, do, um, I do think you're a bit of a, so, you know, the thing is, we have this phrase, um, old and wise. Mm. But the truth is that a lot of people just grow old, right? It doesn't necessarily come with it. <laughs> But I think you are like a prodigy for growing older and wiser. <laughs> I do think I enjoy it. Yeah, you. I think I enjoy getting older. Yeah. I mean, oh. I do right now. My mother says, "Oh yeah, you you say that now." <laughs> no, I. There's still there's so much to enjoy. Yeah. But I love it. I love it that you're already thinking that. And um, you know, I I I just you know, I'm. So excited for your um, tenure representing poetry and representing mm-hmm. all of us. And I'm excited that you have so many more years of aging and writing <laughs> and getting wiser ahead. And we got to be here at this early stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, I think I'd just like to end with a few more poems. Yeah. Because I couldn't decide <laughs> which ones I wanted you to read. We haven't read much from The Carrying, which is mm. a wonderful book. Um, Okay, I'm going to give you some choices. Why don't you read The Quiet Machine? Actually, that's in Bright Dead Things. Um, this, is, this is like a self-care poem. I almost think that this poem could be used for, as a meditation. I think it's definitely a writing prompt, too, right? Like uh-huh. There's a lot of different people. It's page 13, sorry. Oh, thank you. People yeah. will ask me a lot about my process, and it is, like I said, silence. But then I just examine like all the different ways of being quiet. It's a prose poem. The Quiet Machine. I'm learning so many different ways to be quiet. There's how I stand in the lawn. That's one way. There's also how I stand in the field across from the street. That's another way because I'm farther from people and therefore more likely to be alone. There's how I don't answer the phone and how I sometimes like to lie down on the floor of the kitchen and pretend I'm not home when people knock. (laughs) There's daytime silent when I stare and nighttime silent when I do things. There's shower silent and bath silent and California silent and Kentucky silent and car silent. And then there's a silence that comes back a million times bigger than me, sneaks into my bones and wails, and wails, and wails, until I can't be quiet anymore. That's how this machine works. Mm, I love that. (laughs) Um, So in The Carrying, there are these two poems on Facing Pages uh, that uh, both have fire in the title. Mm. These are... These are heavier. Mm-hmm. Um, page 86 mm-hmm. and page 87. I feel like the short poem, maybe read that one, be after the fire mm. poem, is such a wonderful example of so much of what we've been talking about, how mm. poetry can speak to something that is impossible to speak mm. about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Page 87. After the fire. You ever think you could cry so hard that there'd be nothing left in you? Like how the wind shakes a tree in a storm until every part of it is run through with wind. I live in the low parts now, most days a little hazy with fever and waiting for the water to stop shivering out of the body. Funny thing about grief, its hold is so bright 
and determined like a flame, like something almost worth living for. I think to grief is something that um, is very... We, we have so much to grieve, even mm-hmm. as we have so much to walk towards. Mm-hmm. We're so, it's so hard to speak of, to honor, to mark in mm-hmm. this culture. I, I really love. Yeah, I think there's so much value in grief. Yeah. And it's continual, <laughs> you know, and that it hits you sometimes. You're never like, oh, I'm just done grieving. <laughs> I mean, you can pretend you are, <laughs> right? But we aren't. And then it hits you or something, you like touch a doorknob and it reminds you of, your, you know, your mother's doorknob or, you know, there's just something, something happens and you get all of a sudden for it to come flooding back. Um, in this particular poem was written after the 2017 fires in my home valley of Sonoma, and when so much of the natural world was burned, and I kept thinking about all the trees and the birds and the wildlife. Um, and I, I think there was this moment where I was like, oh, I'm just, I'm sort of living to see what happens next, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. And the grief is also giving me a reason to get up. And that, that is so much more present with us all the time. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, So I want to do two more, also from The Carrying. And the next one is Dead Stars, which follows a little bit in terms of how do we live, how do we live in this time of catastrophe that also calls us to rise and to learn and to evolve. Yeah, I think it's very dangerous not to have hope. And if you can't have hope, I think we need a little awe Mm. or a little wonder or at least a little curiosity. I wrote in my notes, um, (laughs) just my little note about what this was about, recycling and the meaning of it all. I don't think that's that. (laughs) Kind of true. We boiled it down. (laughs) I will say this poem began, I was telling you how poems begin sometimes with sounds, sometimes with images. This was a sound of, you know, when everyone rolls out their recycling at the same time. And it sounds like, it it sounds like thunder. And then you go, oh, no, no, that's just recycling. So that's in the poem. But it's, it's about more than that. Dead stars. Out here, there's a bowing even the trees are doing. Winter's icy hand at the back of all of us. Black bark, slick yellow leaves, a kind of stillness that feels so mute, it's almost in another year. I am a hearth of spiders these days, a nest of trying. We point out the stars that make Orion as we take out the trash the rolling containers, a song of suburban thunder. It's almost romantic as we adjust the waxy blue recycling bin until you say, man, we should really learn some new constellations. (laughs) And it's true. We keep forgetting about Antlia, Centaurus, Taurus, Draco, Lacerta, Hydra, Lyra, Lynx. But mostly we're forgetting we're dead stars too. My mouth is full of dust, and I wish to reclaim the rising, to lean in the spotlight of streetlight with you toward what's larger within us, toward how we were born. Look, we are not unspectacular things. We've come this far, survived this much. What would happen if we decided to survive more, to love harder, What if we stood up with our synapses and flesh and said, no, no to the rising tides, stood for the many mute mouths of the sea, of the land? What would happen if we used our bodies to bargain for the safety of others, for earth, 
if we declared a clean night, if we stopped being terrified, if we launched our demands into the sky, made ourselves so big people could point to it, us with the arrows they make in their minds, rolling their trash bins out after all of this is over. <laughs> <laughs> So I feel like the last one I'd like for you to, to, to read for us is the new national anthem, no. which, I, which you read at your inauguration yeah. um, as Poet Laureate. And you mentioned that when you wrote this, when was it that you wrote it? 2016. 2016. Do you, you remember that? If you had thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you said that you, if, if you had, you, this would be the poem that would mean that you would never be Poet Laureate. Yeah. I was convinced. I wrote it, and then I immediately sent it to an editor who was a friend of mine and said, I don't know if you want this. And he was like, it was like up the next day on the website. I was like, oh. And then I came downstairs and I was like, Lucas, I'm never going to get to be with Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> the mystery of it all. <laughs> and then I'll say this, that they, um, you know, the Library of Congress, they're amazing. And the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, um, had me read this poem, so. A new national anthem. The truth is, I've never cared for the national anthem. If you think about it, it's not a good song. <laughs> it's too high for most of us, with the rocket's <laughs> red glare. And then there are the bombs. Always, always, there is war and bombs. Once I sang it at homecoming and threw even the tenacious high school band off key. But the song didn't mean anything, just a call to the field, something to get through before the pummeling of youth. And what of the stanzas we never sing? The third that mentions no refuge could save the hireling and the slave. Perhaps the truth is, every song of this country has an unsung third stanza. Something brutal snaking underneath us as we absent-mindedly sing the high notes with the beer sloshing in the stands, hoping our team wins. Don't get me wrong. I do like the flag. How it undulates in the wind like water elemental, and best when it's humbled, brought to its knees, clung to by someone who has lost everything, when it's not a weapon, when it flickers, when it folds up so perfectly you can keep it until it's needed, until you can love it again, until the song in your mouth feels like sustenance, a song where the notes are sung by even the ageless woods, the short grass plains, the Red River Gorge, the fistful of land left unpoisoned, the song that's our birthright, that's sung in silence when it's too hard to go on, that sounds like someone's rough fingers weaving into another's, that sounds like a match being lit in an endless cave, the song that says, my bones are your bones, and your bones are my bones, and isn't that enough? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Ada Lamone is the 24th Poet Laureate of the United States. Her six books of poetry include, most recently, The Hurting Kind. Her volume, The Carrying, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry, and her book, Bright Dead Things, was a finalist for the National Book Award. She is a former host of the poetry podcast, The Slowdown, and she teaches in the MFA program at Queens University of Charlotte in North Carolina. Special thanks this week to Daniel Slager, Jana Demkevich, and Katie Hill at Milkweed Editions. 
Also, Kristen Brogdon, Lindsay Siders, Brad Kern, John Marks, Emery Snow, and the entire staff at both Northrop and the Ted Mann Concert Hall of the University of Minnesota. The On Being Project is Chris Hegel, Loren Drummerhausen, Eddie Gonzalez, Lillian Vo, Lucas Johnson, Suzette Burley, Zach Rose, Colleen Scheck, Julie Seipel, Gretchen Honnold, Padre Gautuma, Gautam Shrikishan, April Adamson, Ashley Herr, Amy Chatelaine, Romy Neme, Cameron Musar, Kayla Edwards, Juliana Lewis, and Tiffany Champion. On Being is an independent, nonprofit production of the On Being Project. We are located on Dakota land. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. Our closing music was composed by Gautam Shrikishan. And the last voice you hear singing at the end of our show is Cameron Kinghorn. Our funding partners include the Hearthland Foundation, helping to build a more just, equitable, and connected America, one creative act at a time. The Fetzer Institute, supporting a movement of organizations applying spiritual solutions to society's toughest problems. Find them at Fetzer.org. Kaliapaya Foundation, dedicated to reconnecting ecology, culture, and spirituality, supporting organizations and initiatives that uphold a sacred relationship with life on Earth. Learn more at Kaliapaya.org. The Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. And the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is produced by On Being Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota.